Here's my big message today. If you want to improve rapidly in places you never thought you could, then start dividing your effort equally between developing the case story and delivering it. Who here, tell the truth, last time you went to trial or were about to go to trial, did not write your opening statement within 72 hours of going to trial until 72 hours before? You didn't write your opening statement. Three days ago. Who here wrote your opening statement within three days of going to trial? <laughs> Look around the room. Who here, my recommendation is, who here wrote it at least six weeks before trial? Thank you. See, they get in when all the paper starts coming in, you know, the Thursday before trial, the waves of motions start coming in. Oh, here's another box. And then the judge, well, I'll get to it, don't worry. Maybe I'll wait until I hear the evidence on that. Oh, thanks, Your Honor. It's punitive damages. <laughs> you know, we kind of need to know. It's a death penalty. We kind of want deer on it, you know? Make a decision. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? When all the stress piles up and every little detail all of a sudden becomes the most important thing in the whole darn world because it happens to be in front of me at this moment and it's 7.30 in the morning, the day before I go to trial. And it's some stupid thing. And it's like, we don't have shoes for the third witness or whatever. <laughs> you know, we, he doesn't want to stay at the Holiday Inn, you know. <laughs> so, oh, that's really important. You know what I'm talking about? All perspective goes out the window. What a good time to sit down and calmly reflect <laughs> on how persuasive you're going to be by whipping out that opening statement around 11.30, 11.45 that night, right? Six weeks before, if they change something, if they take something out, if you get a piece of evidence or a witness eliminated, so what? You take out a paragraph. It's already written. If you win a motion, you put in a paragraph, but it's already written. It's already time to go with your demonstratives, which are also done minimum four weeks before trial, completed. And if you're not doing focus groups before you finish discovery, what a waste of time and money. Now, not necessarily uh, n uh, always before you start discovery, because that's hard, too. And a lot of people have, you know, some concerns about your litigation budget. So if you're stuck doing one really big piece of research, then do it about midway. If you've got expert testimony, then do it when you know roughly what the experts are going to be. Maybe you've seen some preliminary reports. Maybe you've talked to the other guys. Maybe they've hinted about some stuff. Maybe you've even seen some secondary expert they're probably not going to put up. But before the big gun experts get their depositions taken, be sure you do your research, because then you can go in and shape their testimony to fit your story in ways that they don't even know you're doing. I'm not just talking about the rules of the road. I'm talking about shaping the story like she's talking about, inviting people to think of values, inviting people to think of imagery, bringing demonstratives in to the expert deposition, especially if they drag it out so that it's a trial deposition. They're stuck with your demonstratives on the video before they realize, hey, I can object. Too late. <laughs> that forces settlements more often than anything else, is surprising people with finished demonstratives in an expert deposition that you're taking for trial. Either that expert's out or the whole trial's over. Sometimes. So, how do you do it? How do you focus on delivery as well as development and get you know, your money's worth and your time's worth and your effort's worth on both? Three things. Rapport, managing the images in the decision maker's head, See, because if it's all perception first, then one of your new jobs is managing perceptions. You've been doing it all along. I'm sure that nobody necessarily gave you the job description in law school, but that is still your job. You've got to manage the perceptions that people are having because otherwise you're, you're waiting at the caboose, asking the train to take a different track after it's already rolled over you. Ain't going to work. And last but not least, you want to manage this decision-maker story building, which you've already had a great introduction to, so I'm not going to do a lot of time on that. I do want to show you a couple of different things about it. Number one, please start thinking about this as stories, not story. One of the ways you artificially limit ourselves and how come we uh, ignore the other than conscious mind and all those parts that really run the show is because we think of everything in simple, reduced, arbitrary, easy-to-digest chunks. And we make everything singular. You want to change your life and change the way you relate to jurors? Call them jurors and stop saying the jury. People don't like it when you dehumanize them to their face. 
Don't call them their bias either. That doesn't work too well either. Oh, there's Mr. Defensive Attribution over there. I got to get rid of him. <laughs> Wish I had another peremptory. Well, sir, tell me all about yourself. <laughs> too late now. Think of them as stories. Did you know that everybody that's looking at your case, even an arbitrator, will have about five different stories in their head as they initially come up with it, even if they're experienced? You know, if, even if they've seen a million of these bad baby cases, they'll make up five or six different versions of that story in their head at the outset. But fairly soon, and this is how Hans Zeisel and all those guys ended up getting misquoted as saying everybody makes their decision at the end of opening statement. Uh -uh. What they do make up is the basic parameters of the story they're going to use to judge your case. 